So welcome to the Commercial Real Estate uh, uh, 101 meetup group. Uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, we actually started this group back in uh, April of 2020, kind of in response to COVID. Uh, a lot of people just weren't meeting in person. And so, you know, I figured why not create a virtual meetup where we can engage with people across the nation to learn about the many facets of commercial real estate. Because we can learn a lot from people from all different types of markets, both you know, local specific to their market and also on a macro level as well. So today I have a repeat guest, actually. Uh, he came and spoke with us about uh, prospecting uh, in it, several weeks ago. It, it's probably one, right now I looked at the analytics for the for the podcast. It's one of our top episodes. So he did provide Sweet. a lot of great value. Um, and today I invited him back because of his expertise in logistics real estate. Um, so that's going to be the topic of discussion. And we're excited to to host Logan Hartle, who's a you know, just started a new brokerage as well with his partners. So we're excited to host you, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on again. This is, uh, this is fun. I'm excited to be here and uh, hopefully some people learn some stuff today. I, I always get as much out of this, I think, as everybody else does. I have a blast at these things. So yeah, man. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and the way this is going to be structured, just for these, those of you guys who are tuning in, uh, we're going to be asking a list of questions to Logan and at the end, we'll have a and a So for those of you guys who are on live on LinkedIn and then here in the Zoom chat, uh, feel free to type away and we'll get we'll make sure your questions get answered. But uh, typically to start off, what we like to do is we like to learn a little bit more about the person who's across the table from us. So if you don't mind kind of sharing your backstory, I think it'd be great. Sure, absolutely. So um, grew up in Wheeling, West Virginia. Well, Moundsville, just outside of Wheeling, West Virginia, which is about an hour outside of Pittsburgh, the little sliver of West Virginia, right in between Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, went to West Virginia University for engineering, industrial engineering. Uh, we share that in common. But uh, yeah, not not the same school, but same same degree. But uh, yeah, went to West Virginia for industrial engineering. Uh, got out, spent about ten years in the manufacturing space, primarily working on capital projects, uh, process improvement projects, new product development. Uh, the last five years of that tenure, I had my own manufacturing company. Uh, we sold that uh, in 2020, and I, I have been in the brokerage world ever since, focusing on the uh, the manufacturing, logistics, and industrial space. So um, yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, you know, my, my entry into the brokerage world. Um, and it just as of, gosh, a, a month ago, uh, we officially launched, my partners and I officially launched uh, Monument Real Estate Partners, um, which is a, a brokerage in the Charlotte market servicing uh, primarily the Carolinas, um, but uh, the Southeast, if you will. So that's awesome. Yeah. And you did mention we share that in common. We're both industrial engineers by trade. Uh, I, I actually went the software route. You went the more traditional industrial engineering route, but uh, it's yeah. it's unique the 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 skill set you gain from that experience because number one obviously you operated in the manufacturing capacity so you can speak to those owners about what what they go through because you understand because you were one of those individuals and also on the operations sure. side of things I mean it's immensely valuable as well so um, absolutely absolutely yeah yeah there's I mean you probably went through this similar classes I had where you're you're doing cross docking problems and you're mm -hmm. doing all sorts of fun stuff in in that world and it's uh it's interesting it really is I, I never really utilized a lot of that in yeah. my manufacturing space but it's it's uh you know the industrial engineering degree is a is a great degree for what we do because it teaches you it, it problem solving in general I mean is, mm -hmm. is a huge facet of, of engineering is learning how to solve problems um, but getting exposure to that getting exposure to the industrial space has been huge for my career. That's awesome, man. Really. So one thing I was kind of curious about is obviously the, the topic of discussion is understanding logistics, real commercial real estate. However, mm. obviously that, and there's a specification between logistics, real sure. estate, and obviously other types of industrial property. So if you could specify what the difference is between logistics, manufacturing, and maybe flex, I know those are, those are kind of the three yeah, categories. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so logistics, j just the term logistics is the coordination of products through the supply chain, right? You're, you're trying to coordinate everything from, from raw material all the way through the end uh, where, where a product's being developed, uh, you know, sent to the user. So my iPhone from, from the very start of when it was constructed from, from all the raw materials to when it was assembled, you know, the coordination of all that is, is essentially logistics and, and the, the commercial real estate or the industrial real estate world, as you alluded to, is kind of broken into multiple different categories. So, um, you know, the logistics is going to focus more on, on, uh, trucking and in warehousing and storage and the movement of these products. 
the manufacturing side of it is actually the the making of these products, whether it's assembly or or maybe it's manufacturing the raw materials, maybe it's taking those raw materials and making products that then are going to be assembled. Um, and then the flex space that you get into is more, you see a lot more, um, you, th there can be manufacturing companies in flex spaces, but you'll see flex space as office warehouse mix. And it's it tends to be, um, you know, flexible in what and how much of each, right? You can quickly add some walls to add some more office space, take down some to create some more warehouse space. Um, and and not that it's just these, but you see a lot of contractors in those spaces, you know, maybe environmental companies. Um, but but yeah, that's kind of the, the the breakdown. And if we're if we're just looking at the kind of the supply chain and the logistics world as a whole, um, you, you know people tend to think these large warehouses, like they just, you know, if you're not familiar with the space, you just think, yeah, it's a big warehouse, right? But what goes on inside of that warehouse is really the designation. Is there somebody manufacturing something in there or are they storing it and distributing product? Of course. Yeah. And so for those of you guys who don't know, uh, Logan operates a lot in, in, in that space in his, in his capacity, uh, but also on the investment side, this is something I was kind of curious about. So what are some of the characteristics sure. or qualities that people look for in logistics real estate primarily. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I mean you think about the 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 actual process itself, right? Products coming in the door. You need to be able to quickly get that product into the building. So a lot of dock doors, right? Typically for logistics real estate, you want a lot of dock doors so you can move product. You don't want 10 trucks backed up waiting to get into one dock door. You know, you may be 20, 30, 50, 100 dock doors on the side of a building. Um, and, and it's going to depend on, on, you know, what type of product and, and what type of scenario you have. So if you are just a straight warehousing company where you're going to take in bulk pallets and just store them there and wait until they need to ship out, and then you're going to ship them out. There may not be a whole lot going on inside that facility. So, you know, a couple dock doors and, and, and some storage space might be all you need. Uh, if you are going to be breaking that pallet down into smaller pallets that are then going to go out or you're go doing any sort of kitting where you're taking, you know, pallets from multiple different or products from multiple different pallets and kitting them together, and then shipping them out. Uh, you may have, you know, a lot, a lot greater needs for, um, you know, automation or, or, or inventory management systems. Um, and if you are, you know, even down to the point of third party logistics companies, 3PLs, which are basically order fulfillment companies, they, you know, they may even be, be taking that product packaging it and sending it directly to the end user. Um, so so depending on what type of the logistics uh, realm you're getting into from, from an investment standpoint, you, you got to make sure that the building is going to support that functionality. So that's awesome. Yeah. And so typically with your investor clients, just out of curiosity, you know, sure. a lot of these, a lot of these spaces are, are they typically already occupied by a tenant? Or is it one of those things where, you know, if they're looking at an opportunity that let's say is vacant, mm -hmm. some, some of the things they're looking at and say, okay, well, you know, given the characteristics of this property, what would be an optimal user for this particular, you know, space? Yeah, yeah. You know, they, a majority of them want occupied property, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the industrial space, most of the clients I work with uh, are far more comfortable. Most people are far more comfortable if there's already a tenant in place, you've proven the model, you've proven that this place can work as a logistics hub. And, uh, you know, it just lends a level, level of comfortability. Um, you know, there, there, I do have clients who will buy vacant. Um, you know, typically the prices are lower and there's a discount for that risk, for taking on that risk. Um, but they are looking for that. Yeah, they're looking for or, you know, are the are the clear heights correct? You know that that's from from the floor to the the lowest object in the ceiling that you're going to hit. So if you need to drive forklifts through, what are you going to be able? You know, you know wh what's the what's the lowest uh, clear height? So so you know what you can get in the building and what you can't. Um, you can know how high you can go with racking. So you know, it used to be you know old school was 12, 14, 16 foot ceilings. Now it's you know 20, 30, even close to 40 foot ceilings for a lot of these uh, you know large distribution companies now. Um, you know if you're if you're driving and seeing a new class A development being built, they're not building 20 foot ceiling buildings. They're building 35, 40 foot ceiling buildings because um, they want to go vertical. Um, but yeah, so so it depends on the client. Um, a lot of, uh, in particular, a lot in my area are if they are looking at something that's vacant, you know, they would almost rather just build new uh, because you may have a vacant building that's 24 foot ceilings. And it's like, look, I'm, I'm just going to build, buy some land and, and build a 40 foot ceiling building. And I, now I know my, the, the breadth of, of tenant is much larger because someone may only need, you know, 20 foot, but you know, that the location is perfect for them. And so they're going to put there, but you, op you open yourself up to the large distribution companies that need that 40 foot clear height. So um, yeah, it, it just depends. But, but the, to answer your question, yeah, they're, they're definitely looking at the buildings. They're, they're trying to understand 
what types of tenants could fit in this building. Um, and, and if we are going to use it for logistics, you know, it needs to have clear height. It needs to have dock doors. Um, if it's, if it's a, an area that's heavy in, um, you know, st let's say steel manufacturing, it better have some pretty heavy cranes. You better have some pretty heavy product to, or, or cranes to move product throughout the building because it may not just be forklifts. So um, all those things come into play depending on, on um, you know, who the tenant's going to be. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, you know, like you alluded to before, I mean, a lot of the legacy product on, it depends on where you're located. I'm sure in your market, it's similar to, to what is happening here, where we have sections mm -hmm. of the city that were, you know, built maybe many, many years ago. And the, what was the needs of tenants at that point in time has obviously shifted and evolved since then. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the the value of property for you know, logistics has obviously shifted based on, you know, ceiling heights and all the other characteristics that you identified in that particular sure. uh you know, uh, discussion. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting to hear your take on that. Uh, one thing I'm kind of curious about is obviously, you know, you're working in the capacity of a broker and typically it's with investors. So you, you're trying to identify property for these individuals who are looking to buy, you know, real estate that can provide them with some sort of return from the owner's mm -hmm. perspective. How are some, what are some of the characteristics or ways that you can you know, amplify the value of your asset. And I'm sure you advise clients as well, if you're representing mm -hmm. them, uh, what are some of the things you kind of recommend on their end to be able to say, okay, if we do this, we can maybe package mm -hmm. it in a way that's most attractive to, um, you know, investors. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, assuming you, you, your building's not obsolete and assuming mm -hmm. you've got something that's, that's attractive, um, you know, obviously the, the, the longer and the better, the lease, the better, right? So, mm -hmm. so if, if somebody signs a two year lease, it's not as good as a, as a 10 year lease. Now it, that depends, uh, you know, cause some folks, it depends on the end buyer, right? So, mm -hmm. so if, if we're trying to take this product to a, a large private equity company that, that is looking for cash flow, then, and, and we think this is a good market for that. You know, there have been several sales to these types of groups in that market for this particular type of asset, then it makes sense to to try to lease this up. Let's let's focus on leasing first. Let's get a long-term lease in place and then take this to market to those groups because that's what they're looking for. They want to see seven, eight, 10 years plus left on the lease. Let's let's go that route first. Some groups will find it attractive if there's only two years left. Let's say, let's say you're you've had a tenant in for 10 years, there's two years left on that lease and Per their escalation in their lease, they're they're at five dollars a foot, and the market is now at nine dollars a foot. They may view that as an as an asset that they want to take down that's more valuable because they see that upside, right? They don't have to wait eight, ten years to 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 reflect uh, or to, excuse me to to move to to uh, to the market rates. They can they look two that two years down the road can underwrite according to that and then move forward. So um, you know it depends on a scenario by scenario basis. Every you know every property you know recommend cleaning it up. If you've got things that are that are messy or nasty, clean it up, make it look nice, clean you know fresh paint helps. Uh, if you've got old lighting, new LED lighting helps. Um, if your dock doors are, are are nasty and broken and bent in, you know, replacing those can help. Um, just just cleaning it up like you would with any other asset that you that you have. Uh, but as far as the you know the investor side of things it's it's all the value for them it's all in the numbers and 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 one of the things that um you know, there's a lot of different ways to add that value. You can add it through the lease. You can add it through if there's additional land that they can develop. Um, outdoor storage is huge right now. So if there's additional land that can be cleared and they can lease the building, plus have some outdoor space, that's a big add-on, a big uh, a big benefit. So it really depends on the property specifically. But you know, a lot of those things can be the, the things that you can fix. Uh, you know, you definitely should. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you mentioned outdoor storage. That's definitely been a hot topic. Like. I mean, a lot of clients that I've dealt with in the past have all been looking for outside storage as well. So mm -hmm. um, it's pretty, pretty impressive to see. And again, I, I've been in the business for a couple of years now. And so that, that wasn't a request that was happening when I first started back in 2019. And again, obviously sure. my experience level was not where it needed to be as far as, you know, getting the flow of clients, but I just feel like it's, it has evolved over the last several years that now it's become a very hot topic. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. You know, you think as as e-commerce continues to grow and it continues to shift a lot more of, of the focus from 
e-commerce away from brick and mortar, you're going to have more trucks on the road. And with mm -hmm. more, you, you got to have somewhere to store them. You know, a truck driver that lives in his, in a, in a decent neighborhood, more than likely the HOA is not going to let him park his truck in that neighborhood. You got to have a place to store it. Or if there's a fleet mm -hmm. of those trucks, you know, they got to go somewhere at night. So you're seeing more of these outdoor storage facilities for trucks, trailers, equipment, you know, even materials for, you know, if you've got a lot of construction going on, you may have, you know, large sections that you've probably driven up and down highways and seen fields of just full of piping, you know, mm -hmm. things like that, that, that these companies need outdoor storage space, just lay down space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got several, I'm working with several people right now that they're, they're like diesel repair and trucking companies. So they, they have like yep. a lot of, they have a need for outdoor storage where they can store the trucks that they're ultimately working on for yep. the GEs or other types of companies that, you know, obviously use them, their services for whatever function sure. they're trying to fulfill. So yeah, I mean, there's, sure. there's, there, it's just an interesting uh, uh, talking point for sure. So yep. one of the, one of the things I wanted to touch on, and, and obviously this is something that we had kind of touched on in the previous uh, episode related to prospecting, but, you know, sure. one of the things that, you know, a lot of, you know, it, cause it, just to give you some background on, on the audience as well. I mean, we have people who are business owners, we have people who are investors, we have people who are tenants, we have people who are brokers. And so really mm -hmm. speaking to more of the, the broker side at, at this point in time, like how did you get started in that space on the logistics front? You know, I know obviously you had the experience from, you know, your background in industrial engineering and ultimately you own a manufacturing company, but as you look to scale your business and now you started mm -hmm. your brokerage with, with partners and you guys have a lot of, you know, a runway for success. I think you guys are going to kill mm -hmm. it, which I'm really excited to see uh, long term. But how did you, you know, start generating those opportunities for yourself in the logistics space? Yeah, I think I think you know it, it's twofold. I, I'm, I'm the type of person I want the education before I jump in, right? I want to learn, um, and and there's part of that that you can't learn until you jump in. But I want to learn as much as I can prior to that. So a lot of educating myself on, uh, you know, it, it, it helped that I was in that world, so so I knew kind of where to look. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know what to ask. Um, so, but but a lot of a lot of articles, a lot of a lot of uh, our, our friend Chad is is a nice uh, resource for stuff like that. So 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 leaning on people that you know to ask questions. Um, it is always helpful, um, but there is a lot of it that 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 you kind of have to jump in and go. I mean, you can't, you know, you, when you become a broker, you don't get paid until something closes, so you can't spend four years learning it through real estate you and not make a paycheck. So you got to go and and you know, there's there's you know, if you're a broker just starting out, and you want to get involved in this and you want to learn. Partnering with another broker is a huge way to do it. If you get an opportunity, you bring someone in that knows exactly what they're doing. Bring them in; they'll give you a part of the deal. You guys can split the deal however you you work out uh, and learn. Learn, learn that way. Um, I highly recommend, uh, you know, subscribing to if you've got a local business journal, subscribing to that. If you want to follow, you know, read read CoStar articles, read read as much as you possibly can, just to learn that space and understand, you know, if you're just starting out in there, understand the lingo, understand, you know, what it is that uh, that makes this industry tick, so to speak. Um, and and as you read stuff, you know, you know read it. And if, if there's a word in there, you don't understand, dig into that word. If there's a concept, you don't understand, dig into that concept, but uh, it starts with education. So just, just educating yourself. Um, and then from my perspective, how I got these opportunities, I do a lot of just cold prospecting, um, reaching out to folks. I, I moved to Charlotte, the Charlotte market at the end of 2020. So um, I had no choice, but the cold prospect, it, it was a scenario where, look, I, I know the, the market, I know the industry I've been studying, you know, you know, how to, how to make my own pro formas. I've been studying financial, uh, uh, modeling and, and, and everything that could encompass the uh, the investment space as it pertains to industrial, you know, I, I was familiar with. But the one thing that I didn't have was a circle. So uh, it, for me, it was you better get out there and pound the pavement, or you're not going to have opportunities. So um, a lot of cold calling, cold emailing, uh, networking, so on and so forth, and just kind of putting your name out there as an industrial person. And, and, and I think there's something to be said about niching. You know, for me, I specifically focus on industrial um, and I want to do that. It's not that I can't help someone with a multifamily property. It's not that I can't help someone with, with a retail property, but when, when my name's floating out there in the ether, I want industrial to be tied to it because it's a great way to market yourself. And, 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 you know, not just from, from, you know, potential clients, but other brokers who may say, look, I, I don't know anything about industrial, but I know Logan does. So that's a, a, other brokers is a great way to get leads when you're first starting out as well. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a multitude of ways. I know that was a long winded answer. No, but, no, uh, I think, yeah. I think, I think it's good to hear from someone who has, you know, you know, cause you've hit the ground running, man. Like you got, you're, you're getting out there on a regular basis. And if you guys haven't listened to our podcast episode uh, just several weeks ago, actually, it's, it's super mm -hmm. enlightening. And I would highly encourage you guys to do so. If you guys are looking to, you know, become recognized as some sort of like industrial real estate broker, 
definitely worth uh, listening to and, and watching. We also have it on YouTube as well. But uh, one thing that I wanted to ask is obviously in, in our current environment, you know, we're in a very, you know, kind of wavy environment right now. You know, the interest mm -hmm. rates have been spiking. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the economy right now. And so how have you seen, uh, you know, I guess, the the demand and and really just your market shifting over the last let's say six months and where do you foresee you know the shift continuing over the next six to twelve? Yeah, you know I think that uh, just just from the conversation I'll I'll do some anecdotal just from the conversations that I've had as well as some stats there. So um, I. I, I you see it and everybody sees it I think across the board when you're dealing with buyers that they're still very interested if you're a real estate acquisition person and you want to buy real estate it's in your blood it's not a scenario where yesterday I was selling cars today I decided to sell real estate like no these these groups buy real estate as their business and so they're they're still doing that it's just their underwriting models are changing though you know mm -hmm. it, and they have to if you could get four percent interest six months ago and now it's six percent it, it's going to change your numbers so there's a lot of educating on on the seller side of, of that you know there I think Think we're in a bit of a lull period right now in between uh you, you know it's like it, we've got this whiplash coming right we're, we're at that period where there's this where sellers still think the market was what it was six months ago and buyers are saying i can't pay those numbers or i can't write underwrite to the same to the same standards so there's this little pull back and forth and and if interest rates continue to rise and continue to do what they're what they're doing then i think eventually the buyer side of that is going to win out and and sellers are just going to realize look something that that was on the market for two weeks is now on the market for three months. Something that was going to take three months is going to take a year. And and when that starts to happen, it's, you know, it is what it is. Prices are going to start to come down. People are going to start to, if they want to sell, they're going to start to, to, to make, make those decisions. Now, if somebody's got, you know, property that's paid off and, and it's cash flowing well, then maybe their, their decision is just to wait four or five years to see what happens. Um, but we're seeing that we're seeing, we're seeing buyers pull back a, a little bit on their, their underwriting, but still aggressively trying to acquire property. Um, the industrial space is, is nice because Typically, uh, these buildings uh, come along with longer term leases, you know, you know, five to 10, 15 year leases aren't uncommon, especially when you're working in the, you know, absolute net world where, where someone's going to be either it's through a sale lease back or it's a company that's going to take over and do an absolute net. Those are great. So um, those, I think, are always going to be attractive because, uh, you know, as long as the company that that's moving in there has it has, you know, a, a path forward and, and they're not going to be negatively affected too much by the economy, then I think you've got a really strong tenant and and it's just a financial equation at that point. If you can lock in your rate and it makes sense, and then the the investment makes sense. Um, you know, I, I think industrial in general has has this. In specifically in our market, we've got a couple things that are really uh, really positioning us well to, con to have continued growth in the industrial market, even as the economy starts to wane a little bit. Um, we've got it, we've got population growth, so I think there's something around 120 people a day move to Charlotte, about 40 move out, so you've got a delta of about 80 a day moving to Charlotte. So when you've got 25 or 30 thousand people a year moving into an area, uh, you're going to continue to need apartment housing. You're going to continue to need homes built. You're going to continue to need infill for things like retail, and you're going to continue to need services for those people. Which, from the small contractors that are going to take up the flex spaces, all the way up to, you know, the e-commerce distribution companies that now need to store more product because there's a lot more people here. Um, you know, you're going to continue to see that growth. Uh, e-commerce in general is is kind of what's what spurned the uh, the the explosion of industrial development and spec development over the last couple of years. Um, just from 2021, I, I think there was about $870 billion in total e-commerce uh, sales. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that was 14%, up 14% mm -hmm. from 20, 2020 is up 14%. Already Q1 and Q2, uh, and this is just from, from census.gov, uh, already in Q2, we're at $507 billion. So, I mean, you look at that and it's, it's holy cow, we're on track to, to add, what, 20% to that already from last year. Um, and, and CBRE had a study out uh, that for every billion dollars that transitions from brick and mortar retail to e-commerce, there's 100 or 1.25 million square feet of industrial space needed. So, I mean, you look at that and just, just from last year to this year, if that number is true, that's 250 million square feet more. I mean, Charlotte in and of itself, the whole market has 350 mil, some million square feet. So, I mean, that's you, you basically with, with just the trend in e-commerce that we've seen, 
you need another Charlotte to pop up in the U.S. somewhere. I mean, it's it's insanity to think about mm-hmm. the, the level, the magnitude. So as, as long as those trends continue, I think you're going to continue to see industrial growth uh, continue to go. I mean, uh, uh, kind of playing along that same trend, but more of a niche in the cold storage world. I read an article that said uh, that right now, I think in 2021, 13% of all groceries were bought uh, through e-commerce channels, and their projection is 21.5% by 2025. So huge growth there. I mean, you think about all the frozen groceries we order, um, and, and as those things continue to happen, I mean, you're going to need more and more buildings to to uh, you know to accompany that, and, and not just the companies that are the logistics companies, but all the service industries around surrounding that are going to need industrial space as well. Absolutely. Yeah. We had a gentleman, George, actually, uh, out of Miami who specialized in cold storage. He talked about, you know, the market mm-hmm. down there and it's impressive. Like you said, obviously, you know, online grocery uh, sales have been continuing to increase and that obviously mm-hmm. amplifies the demand for cold storage. And on top of that, the the restaurant business. Uh, it, I mean, it's pretty amazing to me, even locally. Uh, I have several, I, I do a lot on the retail side and I'm working with the several restaurant owners and you can't find space. I mean, it's yeah, unbelievable unless you build it out, in which case yep. you're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. And a lot of owners are just like, why would I you know, do that? Yeah. So, you know, pre-existing or second generation of restaurant space is really hard to come by right now. And so, you know, we're still, 100%. I think we're still very active. And I think more so what's, what's probably been happening is that people are just, like you said, there's a whiplash happening and there, there, mm-hmm. at some point commercial real estate will catch up because residential real estate, it, it, it's, it, it, it re- reacts a lot quicker. And so sure. right now yeah. I think they're, they're, the seller's expectations are starting to come down on the residential front, but commercial real estate always lags residential yeah. real estate. So I, I got kind of in agreement with you. I think that as you know, we start acclimating to the current environment, we'll start to normalize here in 2023. And I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I think there's going to be, you know, opportunities for people in the marketplace. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No. So, so one last question before we dive in and allow people to kind of ch- type away in the chat box and and also on LinkedIn Live if you guys are watching. So you had mentioned you know some of the resources that you know you have used to kind of learn a little bit more about the the logistics uh, real estate mm-hmm. space. Can you kind of elaborate on a few of those? I know we had you know obviously you and Chad are the experts, and I always kind of lean on you guys when we. Have yeah. Questions. Yeah. I mean, there's there are some great sources. I mean, if you have a CoStar account, if you have access or somebody that does have access, there's phenomenal articles there. They do have some free ones out there as well, and they're a great source. Um, you know, CBRE puts out tons of content, tons of of studies, and and just what have you. Go look, and it's you'll find just a plethora of information there. They've got a lot more resources than us smaller brokers, just so. But they put out some really good stuff. Um, uh, Globe Street is is a website that I would check out. It's just g l o b e s t dot com, um, and it's a it's a phenomenal commercial real estate website where you can go and you can you can filter down articles from from every single asset class, and, and it's just a great way to learn. I, I would check out Chad's YouTube channel because Chad puts out a ton of content. Whether you're just starting or you are uh, you know a, an expert in the in the field, you're going to learn something from Chad. Um, and and if if you know if it's not from him, it's from one of his guests. He's got a podcast as well and it's phenomenal so um i think it's the industrial real estate podcast and chad griffiths is his name so check him out so those are some resources i would i would get involved in for sure absolutely yeah he's 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 I, sometimes i feel like he's got a product like a full production team like it's pretty right. impressive some of the <laughs> some of the yeah. stuff he puts out and stuff so truly all truly. right all right so what i'll go ahead and do is we'll open it up to q a so i'm going to be checking here on zoom and then i'll also be checking on linkedin live so if you guys are watching the linkedin live feel free to type away in the comments and i'll be reviewing uh them as they come in so first question is we have from greg hey greg um in last mile we often get stuck leasing warehouse that we don't need we simply transload product from truck to delivery with minimal storage and minimal or zero build out what innovations are you seeing in the repurposing of real estate for last mile and if you could specify last mile as well, I think that would be helpful for those those of us who are, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the the biggest task in all the logistics world is the last mile delivery, right? So you've got you've got these these uh, metropolitan centers that are nothing but. Uh, apartment buildings and office buildings and retail and restaurants, and you've got to get stuff from warehouses to those spaces. So um, a lot of the big technology, I think, that's going to be coming out of those is is autonomous drones, um, and you're going to see a lot more of that, specifically in in areas where where you can um, where a the city's going to buy into it and and allow for it, and b where um, you know you you really don't have access much access uh, close by. So so the, the the difficulty is that you know you know can how do you get 
get how do you get um, you know the product from the warehouse to into each of these little individual apartment buildings, if you will, and and a lot of the the technology that's being uh, talked about are these autonomous drones, whether they're whether they're flying uh, or they are uh, little rovers that are going to take a package and and take it out, you know, and, and and deliver it to, you know, drive in the lobby and and scan it in and go up the elevator and deliver it right to your to your apartment. So that's a uh, that's a way to reduce that cost. I I, I read a stat that that upwards of fifty percent of the cost of delivering a product product is that last mile. So they're they're desperately trying to solve that riddle of of how do we uh, how do we handle that. So um, repurposing of real estate for last mile, um, that's a tricky one, right? Because you've got you've got areas that are growing and almost in Charlotte specifically, if you've got a, an area that's happening and it's growing and, and you've got apartments going up and you've got restaurants coming in, uh, they're repurposing those industrial spaces for breweries or restaurants or things like that. So so you're moving farther out and out and out and away from town. So um, it is a tricky one. Um, but but yeah, I think the, dr the drone delivery is, is definitely one of the, the coolest ones that I'm starting to see. Um, you know, that would be uh, that would be of interest. So the, the tricky part about it, another tricky part about it is no, no one wants an ugly warehouse downtown, right? They, they want they want pretty restaurants. And, and if they do have enough open space for a warehouse, they want it to be a park. So it's 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 a tough one for sure. Yeah. And that's something that, you like you said, I mean, the city has a say in it as well, because in situations yep. where you start seeing a lot of population growth, the city works to try to push out these uses that are a little bit heavier, which include logistics and manufacturing and everything sure. else. And so, I mean, like, uh, and, and obviously the rents you can achieve from a lot of these other uses is also, also higher. So if you do have a, if you do have a growing area, a lot of times, like you said, you'll repurpose into a retail, a multifamily or some other form of, mm -hmm. you know, um, higher price per square foot in, in uh, prop product type. So, mm -hmm. and another th question I had, this is more so for myself is, is reverse logistics. This is something that obviously, um, a lot of companies are dealing with right now is that, you know, the Amazons, it may be free shipping, but if a return needs to happen, which I don't know the, the stats on returns, but they're pretty significant. Yeah. I mean, that's not sure. 10 per, it's not 10 percent. It could be slightly more than that. So mm -hmm. the cost of reshipping back to the warehouse is yep. also becoming a lot more, uh, you know, of an issue because as volume mm -hmm. increases, you have. The, the demand as far as returns are concerned. So have you seen or talked to clients about this and how are they addressing uh, that situation? It kind of lends itself maybe to the 3PL clients are, that you're working with. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I think I think you're you're starting on a very visible level and an easy to understand level from you know from just the general layperson looking at it. It's it's why Amazon is partnering with Kohl's and it's why Amazon has drop stations at uh at um Whole Foods, mm -hmm. you know, finding partners where you can bring this back is much cheaper than having to grab it and bring it back. Now they do still have to bring it back, and the uh, the um, the stat that I've heard is it's about twice the the warehouse space you need for returns as as it is for regular distribution, uh, because you don't know what you're getting back and you don't know what it's what shape it's going to be in and how it's going to be, and you've got to repackage it, repurpose it, check it to see if it's still good or not. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a very difficult uh, problem to solve that's much more expensive than than it, it was in the first place. It's why you you know when you order things, I, can't, I hate to keep going back to Amazon, but it's like why it's why when you order things, sometimes they say they keep it. Don't ship it back. Just keep it. It's cheaper for you to just keep it than it is for them to bring it back through the warehouse uh, and, and reship it out. So, um, yeah, it's it's a tricky problem to solve. Um, you know, you know, partnering with with groups who can, you know, you know, bring product back into house is, is one way. On the smaller scale, it's a little bit easier, I think, because if you've got a one a one stop shop, one location company that just brings product in and ships it out, you know, they they may have employees set to do that and put it back on the shelf. But when you're a large company that's shipping product globally, it's a wild challenge. So absolutely, no, for sure. So Greg mentioned that he, they're working on returns as well at v, Vho. So that's that makes okay. sense. Yeah, yeah like it absolutely. is. It is. It is a you know. It is a problem, and it's going to be someone mm -hmm. that we that that a lot of these companies that have their their footprint online to to a large extent are going to have to address going forward as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think it's an opportunity. Every problem is an opportunity, right? So, so you know, we we 
had third-party logistics companies. For those of you who don't know what that is, basically, if, if, if you design a product and you want to market the product, but you want someone else to handle all of the warehousing and, and fulfillment and order order fulfillment and delivering it to the customer, that's third-party logistics, right? Those have come up uh, relatively recent in our history. But, you know, I think the same opportunity exists for returns. You know, there are probably going to be companies that, that that pop up and already have that that are there specifically for processing returns. So if you're the entrepreneurial type out there and you're, uh, and you're looking for an opportunity, opportunity. There's one. So that's awesome. So we have a question from Harrison. Hey, Harrison, Harrison's actually a, uh, an agent at our office too. So he's, he's, cool. uh, so he's asking Gen Z current college graduates specifically. So really, I think it's in the, you know, 18 to let's say 27, mm-hmm. 8, 28 range. So seem to be pushing back against hyper consumption. We have had the last decade, uh, the increase in van life over land camping, et cetera, seems to imply that people are exchanging Amazon products for experiences. People are also picking up old trade skills like wood carving and gardening. How have mm-hmm. you have you seen a decrease in consumption, or are people who are giving up hyper consumption still very niche? So I guess what he's asking is if you look at the demographics and mm-hmm. see the consumption over, you know, the Gen Zs versus Millennials versus sure. Gen X, et cetera, how is that, you know, you know, how are those metrics look like yeah. currently? Yeah, I, I think you know, you know, growing up with uh, with a mom who had either a QVC package or towards the end of of uh, her life an Amazon package uh, arriving every day, I think there's definitely differences between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said in the statistics, you know, you know, Q one and two of e-commerce is already at 507 billion. Last year it was 800 billion the entire year, or 870. So I, I there's definitely an uptick in e-commerce spending, uh, whether that's just transitioning uh, to e-commerce or or we're just we're just buying more in general, I think is, uh, you know, a stat I'll, I would look up. I, I it, Basically, the population is getting bigger, too. I mean, our population mm-hmm. continues to grow globally. And as that happens, even if folks spend less money, if the population continues to grow, then we're going to continue to use products. Um, and even for those things, you, you, you know, most people are, who are going camping are just walking out in the woods. They're bringing stuff with them. So uh, if you're going to go, you know, the van life, people are going to buy a van. They're going to fix it up. Mm-hmm. They're going to buy product to go into that van and fix that van up. So, I, you know, carving, wood carving and gardening, those, those require tools and essential things that, that you got to buy somewhere. So, mm-hmm. Um, I think that the as the population grows and, and people's uh, desirable ta- uh, desirable activities change, it, it you know the market's going to adjust to account for that. But I think consumerism is consumerism. I think we'll still yeah. buy stuff. And so. consumerism too is not just you know products that you would see on TV or on TikTok or whatever else. It's also you mm-hmm. know groceries, as we alluded to, like the the, the demand for you know groceries is going to increase, and I think a big. Mm-hmm big yeah. portion of the population that's going to order that are typically going to be in, in a little bit younger as well. So um, one sure. thing that's kind of interesting to me is obviously, you know, if, you, if you've been on these different social platforms, obviously TikTok and Instagram is the 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 products that are being sold on there. Now they're being targeted mm-hmm. to younger demographics. I mean, I was on TikTok the other day and I was scrolling through and I saw, you know, a, a product placement video um, and and I'm interested, I would be interested to see yeah. like the stats on that. On that. Because I would imagine Gen Z is probably the target audience for a lot of these products as well. Yep. So I would love yep. to see what the 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 consumerism on that front is, um, just yeah. from the products that are being advertised for sure. on the platform. For sure, yeah. And TikTok's actually uh, starting to buy a lot of warehouses. They're they're yeah. actually looking to to start to Absolutely. launch a uh, an e commerce presence. So yep. you've got that. It it shows the 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 big audiences, uh, the folks with the big audiences now. Uh, that's where they want to go. The lar- these large companies are, are are buying into the consumer trends of e commerce, and and you know it makes total sense. You've got so many eyeballs on. You might as well sell stuff. Well, and you think about it, like, yeah, they're a data company, but now you can incorporate a product, right? You can incorporate, yep. you know, reselling and stuff like that. So now you become in the, mm-hmm. the distributions, the logistics business. And, and I actually read that article yep. regarding uh, TikTok and their demand for space. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. So uh, any other questions? I want to make sure we have an opportunity for everyone. Uh, we have several people on LinkedIn Live. If you guys have any questions in particular, feel free to type away. Uh, and also, if you guys are on Zoom, feel free to chat away as well. One thing I was kind of awesome. curious about is you had mentioned, um, you know, during the conversation, you would, you would reference sale and lease back. And this is obviously a very mm-hmm. common tactic that business owners can use to amplify mm-hmm. the, the the sales price of their property. So if you could explain what that is and then kind of explain, you know, what 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 your role is in trying to make sure that you're able to package it pr- appropriately, I think that'd be great. Sure, sure. Yeah. So a sale lease back essentially is 
you as the as the seller of the property also operate a business out of that property, right? And so you want to sell the asset, but you still need to operate. You still want to run your business there. So essentially what happens is that closing, you are both going to sign your closing documents to sell the property as well as signing a lease. So, you know, a lot of people, when you first talk to them about this, it's like, well, why in the world would I do it? Why would I go from being an owner to a tenant? That seems like I'm going backwards. Uh, but it really depends on your company and it depends on what you need, right? You, you may have a business that's in a $10 million building and you've got $50 million worth of equipment in there and you're doing, you know, $400 million a year in, in volume. And you look, the, the, the real, you know, when you look at the the rent I'll be paying versus, you know, maybe my mortgage, uh, in, in the, that number, that real estate number may not be very big in the grand scheme of their their business. Uh, but what really, it, when it really becomes beneficial to the seller is when, let's say, for example, they they can sell that property, um, and their new lease rate is going to be five hundred thousand dollars a year. But they can reinvest that 10 million, and that 10 million is going to get them a 25% return in their business. And now they're bringing in two and a half million dollars a year. Well, that's an easy math equation, right? It is, I, I don't need to be in the real estate business. I want to be in the whatever business. I make rubber duckies and I kill it. I'm going to make more rubber duckies. And, and this 10 million is going to either create a brand new rubber ducky that we could sell to the market, or it's going to, you know, maybe it's going to be used for taking my production costs down. I'm going to reinvest into machinery that's going to cut my costs in half. Uh, and those are the equations that these, these groups are doing. Um, some groups do it for retirement purposes. Some say, hey, the market's doing really well right now. Um, and I, you know, I want to sell and I want to put my money into my retirement account. And five years from now, I'll sell the business. But, you know, for now, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll I want to strike while the iron's hot and, and, and get out of the the uh, you know get out of this real estate. Um, my my job in that in that process is just to educate both sides. Um, you know, it, when it comes to investment groups, uh, they understand the sell lease back and the value of it. You know, rather than buying a vacant building or a building that's tenanted where the tenant's been there for the last five years, you may have a tenant, uh, a potential tenant in this in this owner who's been there for 25 years. That, you know, how much more proof of concept do you need that this this tenant's going to be able to operate in this building and and and, and utilize it in the way they need? Uh, oftentimes, they're they're uh, absolute triple net scenarios, so they're selling and the, and the seller looks at or the buyer gets to buy a building that they have no landlord responsibilities on. There's a tenant that's been there for a long term. You know, they get to see the tenant's financials. So they see where they're going. They see where this money is going to be used for, how it's going to be used, how it's going to grow their business. Um, and then really the sweet spot is is that when it's, look, we, we, we can afford the, the rent right now, but the, if we were to sell it, but this is going to really juice up our, uh, our ROI, juice up our sales. And, and we're going to, you know, triple our sales, whatever it might be. That's really where the sweet spot is. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great vehicle for, uh, for investors to, to get something that's relatively low risk. And it's a great vehicle for businesses who want to fund debt-free expansion. In that same example on that $2 million or $10 million building, if you had $4 million in debt, not only are you getting, you know, selling your building, you're getting that six million dollars in equity, but now you've cleared off that debt. And that might be a line of credit, that might be a mixture of a mortgage. Uh, and, and if you've now got the money to go invest in a new product, your your lines of credit are clear. You know, maybe you can now buy in bulk because you've got free and clear lines of credit bringing your costs down even farther. So there's a lot of different ways it can benefit a seller. Um, and, and a lot of it is just education. Some, some sellers know it already. They know, they, they know the, the process, they know the scenario, they've done it before even sometimes. Um, and some of them, it's just an education process of why it could be beneficial. Absolutely. No, I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's such a valuable uh, strategy to employ if, if it in fact works mm -hmm. for what you're trying to accomplish. It's a reallocation sure. of capital, clearing the balance sheet so you can now reinvest into your business or, you know, put it towards, you know, retirement accounts if you're looking to sell or retire mm -hmm. at some point in time. And, you know, I've, I've even seen even in our, uh, in our, in our local market where, you know, you're, you're representing an owner and they don't know if they want to sell right away, but you say, Hey, you know what, your, your timeline to, for, for, for this business is five, five years. You want to retire when you're 65, you're 60 years old right now. Why not sell the biz building, sign a five-year lease. And at the end of that period of time, you can obviously sell the business and whatever else. Sure. So, yeah, there's yep. different ways to approach it, but uh, thanks for clarifying that because I know that could be a value to people who are listening to this right now. So, absolutely, absolutely, right. yeah, they're fun transactions because there's a lot of interest in them in the marketplace from from a buyer perspective. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not a scenario where you know some scenarios you walk into the building you just know this is a great deal, this one's going to sell. I know it. Some it's a question mark, right? When you go into a a uh, 
you know, you go into a sell leaseback scenario, if it's a good, a good business that's got great financials, you know the building's going to sell. So from a brokerage standpoint, that's the great, a great client to get uh, is someone that wants to sell and do a sale leaseback. And if you're on the buyer side and you find one for your client, they're going to love you. So Absolutely. No, great advice. So call me. Hey, how's it going? Uh, they ask, greetings, everyone. So call me here and brand new to real estate investing. So how can I get cool. into commercial real estate investing? All right. Well, we we already approached some of it earlier. Education is mm -hmm. important. You want to educate yourself for sure on uh, on the different asset classes, the different types, how they function, the, how the leasing structures work in those different asset classes. Um, get yourself a good broker. Touch base with a broker, not just selling brokerage services, but get in charge with the get in touch with a broker because you know that they're going to have insight into your particular marketplace and, and that particular asset class you want to go into. Um, and then once you've done those two things, you've educated yourself, you found a broker. When you find a deal, bring somebody along who knows what they're doing in that particular asset class. I always would recommend that if if you've not done it before, you know. Get, get a mentor, get somebody who who has done it and bring them along, give them part of your deal and, and let them mentor you as part of the, the as part of the transaction. Absolutely. And, and I'll even add on that as well, uh, just because obviously we both deal with investors and, you know, there's very experienced investors and then there's people who are maybe not as experienced. And I would give advice as far as those who are just getting in to have the education piece worked out because any any broker who is operating at a, at a, a significant volume in the marketplace has to allocate their attention to certain to certain buyers, right? So Absolutely. if you come to the table and you just say, hey, broker, can you educate me about the market? Some may sit down with you and and, and go through the process, but a lot of them are going to be like, well, you know, I can allocate my attention elsewhere and potentially get mm -hmm. a better return as well. So what I would encourage you to do is educate yourself, get in touch with lenders, understand what it's going to take for you to be able to afford uh, the property that you're ultimately going to eventually buy, you know, because you may not have yep. a buy, you may not have a property per se identified, but you can sit with a lender and understand, okay, what's the process? Who do I need to talk to build out that team? And then when you start approaching brokers, now you say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be working with these lenders, or I'm going to be, I, I, I've put in, been put in contact with this attorney, you know, so you start building that credibility so that when people do invest time in you, that's because you've educated yourself and put yourself in a position to be successful. Um, so that would be my piece of advice. Um, you know, I, I think it's good to do the, the front end work prior to reaching out. Yep. So that's a great point. Great point. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Yep. Well, uh, any other questions? I want to make sure we have the opportunity to share. All right. Well, we have several on, on LinkedIn, just kind of share it thanking. Um, I think one was related to, um, Jeffrey says that if anyone covers the Bronx, New York, uh, I don't believe I mean, I, I don't, I'm in, I'm in Kentucky. <laughs> I don't, I yeah. don't No, I, uh, I could, I could pull some co-star data for you, but that's about it for Bronx. <laughs> that's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. cool, man. Did uh, last question, do you have anything else that you wish that I would have asked you that you think would have been of value to the audience? Oh man. Um, let me think. I, I, I'm going to go through my notes here because I had some really cool notes here for this. I, I wanted <laughs> to make sure the stat – I'm a huge stat guy, huge nerd. Yeah, so well. the cold storage is interesting. So, yeah, mm -hmm. engineer, all right, go figure. Mm -hmm. You like stats. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think the cold storage stuff is is interesting to me. So it's it's an area that I'm I'm starting to familiarize myself with a lot more, and it's it's a it's a niche that that is still a puzzle to be solved because the development costs for brand-new cold storage are just through the roof. And, you know, the the idea of retrofitting uh, existing buildings for cold storage apparently is is cost prohibitive. So it's yeah. it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out with with the growth of e-commerce in the in the grocery world. Yeah. that So the George, the gentleman we interviewed in, in Miami, said one of the issues with retrofitting is obviously the 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 refrigeration units required to be able to, you know, be in that mm -hmm. in that facility. Very, very expensive. And then the flooring. So apparently you have to have a certain. Oh, yeah. You know, you have to have a certain cl a coat of of whatever that particular material is to be able to ensure that you're not going to have cracking in the facility, which could potentially cause additional issues. So there's a lot of things mm -hmm. that need to be factored in before you can just repurpose a space for cold storage. It's not just put a freezer in there and just you know yeah go to yeah you know. exactly yeah so yeah. it's a little bit different, but absolutely all right. absolutely all right. So um. Yeah. Last question, and then we'll go ahead and, sure. and close sure. it out. So he said, I read it's possible to get properties with zero out of pocket. How is this done? You know, you can there, go ahead and. 
Yeah, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, you know, you can you can acquire a property through a master lease where you you basically lease the entire property as the, as the master tenant and then sublease it back. You, you know, that's not actually buying it, but you can you can tag an option on there. I want an option to buy it. Some people will do that. There may still be a, a small fee for that option. Um, partnering partnering is the biggest one. Whether you're whether you're joint venturing and you're just bringing on a partner who's going to supply the funds and you're going to put in the sweat equity, or or you're going to go through a full syndication or or a fundraise. Um, you know, those those tend to be the the. Uh, the ways to do it, even even those you're going to have some money out of pocket. So if you're going through a syndication or a fundraise, you're going to have some legal costs up front. You're probably going to have some cost on inspecting the building and all those fun things that you're going to have to pay first, and you'll probably get paid back out as part of the uh, the ev eventual transaction. But uh, I would I would highly recommend uh, you know looking into that. Um, there's in commercial real estate, seller financing is an option for for very little money down. Some banks will loan. Let's say it's an 80-20 loan. They will. They they don't care if the 20% is seller financing. They just want to make sure that they're in first position. So you could, you could finance 80% through the bank and 20% through, uh, through the seller. That that can happen. Um, there's, I mean, ordinarily, you're, it's going to be hard to get zero zero money down because you may still have inspections, like I said, and legal mm -hmm. fees and things like that. Yeah. But, but if if it's a you know million dollar building and instead of putting you know, 300,000 of your own money into it, if you spend 10,000 on those things, that's that's pretty darn good. That's basically no money. Absolutely. And and also, I mean, like you said, if you find the opportunity, it's good enough. There's people out there that are going to, yeah. you know, be willing to work with you. And even if you take a small, small, small piece of it, I mean, mm. that just gets you in the game. So, yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Well, cool, man. Absolutely. Logan, thank you again so much for stopping by. You know, obviously you provide a lot of great value and you're a return guest for a reason. So I'm really glad we were able to get this done. And and I'm th I'm I'm super happy and excited for your your adventures in, in, in <laughs> building your brokerage. I think it's going to be awesome. If people want to learn more about what you do, if they want to get in contact with you related to working with you in the in the Carolinas or even the Southwest in, in, in general, I mean, I would highly encourage you guys to reach out to Logan. How would they get in contact with you? Sure. Yeah, you can you can reach out to me. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so just search Logan Hartle. You'll find me, um, Logan Hartle on Instagram. Uh, my my email, if you want to talk business, is Logan at MonumentRep.com. Um, we're in the process of building out that website, so if you go to MonumentRep.com right now, you'll see the coming soon page. So we're we're building out the back end of that now. But uh, yeah, feel free to use any any one of those uh, methods, and happy to chat with you. Absolutely. Well, again, Logan, thank you all. Thank you so much to all you guys who have been tuning in to LinkedIn and, and the Zoom. Thank you all so much as well. This will be recorded. So if you guys are uh, listening to this in a YouTube format or podcast format, uh, you know, it'll be available as well. So again, thank you all so much for stopping by and we'll see you all next time. Thanks. See you, Logan. See you guys. See ya.